Hello friends, my name is Yali Batan, and today I'm here to talk to you about linguistic diversity in education, specifically comparing how different bilingual speakers are treated in society. I was inspired to pursue this topic after a particularly good meeting with my discussion group, all of whom are Spanish speakers except for me, in which they were recounting their experiences and the ideas they ingrained about themselves and their language growing up learning English in America. They said that they felt lesser, unequal, even embarrassed or ashamed of their Spanish abilities. This came to me as something of a surprise, as my meager successes in Spanish 1 and 2 in high school were met with celebration, and my Hebrew abilities have always been perceived as cool, exotic, and cultured. It made me reflect on my own perception of the Spanish language and its many speakers when I was a teenager. On the one hand, I went to a high school that was around 70% Hispanic, so I got to meet and know many Spanish speakers and understand from first-hand experience that they were regular people just like me. However, I couldn't help but notice that they were grossly underrepresented in honors and AP classes, and that they were conversely overrepresented in regulars classes. Not only were these classes taught at a lower academic rigor, but they were also further away from the central areas of school, often in bungalows around the campus perimeter. These classrooms were not only far, requiring students to hustle during passing periods, they were also smaller and darker, and were therefore worse environments for learning. Teachers in these classrooms were usually newer and less experienced, both at teaching and managing students, which made things more challenging for everyone. While I didn't think that deeply about it at the time, in retrospect, there were definitely some ideas that were implicated to me that I never questioned, ones which led to some pretty harmful beliefs about my peers. I was placed into honors classes because I performed well on tests because I was smart, a word which here means that I grew up with access to educational resources and a lot of nurturing from my parents, though at the time I thought my relative intelligence was simply a fact of my being. This had the unfortunate effect of leading me to believe that anyone in the lower track classes got there by virtue of their own lack of intelligence, so blissfully unaware as I was of socioeconomic factors and the particulars of this country's racist history. Thankfully, now I am older and wiser and understand much more about the various levers of power at play. In a broader sense, I can now comprehend systems of power instead of just localized instances, here specifically how American imperialism has led to linguistic hegemony. Ophelia Garcia writes that language was always the companion of empire. The idea that language is one of the things that creates national borders is untrue and is a concept used to further maintain power and control. In reality, most states and societies are multilingual in both the present day and throughout history. What we call national borders today are just lines drawn on a map, often without regard for the geographical and cultural borders that already existed there. Nation states are the result of distinct political decisions to demarcate them as such, not some natural phenomenon. By framing language as tied to a nation, it consolidates power and allows for that language to have cultural dominance. In America, always touted as a great melting pot of all kinds of people, English is assumed to be the default even though so many people speak more than one language. This assumption and decision allows for people whose English might not be so great to be treated worse as either stupid or lazy for not picking up the language. So we can see that the ideas of English being the language of America, as well as the notion that there is some standard, true English, is not a fact but rather an ideology, which Rosina Lippi Green defines as the promotion of the needs and interests of a dominant group or class at the expense of marginalized groups by means of disinformation and misrepresentation of those non-dominant groups. For its continued efficacy and global power to perpetuate, America needs to create a sense of unity, or at least an illusion thereof. By casting English as the dominant language and English speakers as the normative, desirable group, while simultaneously casting other languages and their speakers as lesser, America creates a distinct in and out group. This dichotomizing of people is a tried and true method of social control, sparking patriotism and xenophobia, which cause even more violence and bigotry. It must needs be remarked, however, that not all other languages are treated as equally undesirable, and the speaker makes as much difference as the language in question. Speaking from personal experience, as I briefly mentioned in the beginning of this video, I've seen different types of bilingualism be treated unequally. 
All those Spanish-speaking kids who were placed in ESL classes were considered to be catching up so they could play on the same field as the kids who already spoke English. Never mind the fact that the Spanish we were learning was a version that wouldn't be very useful in actual conversation with fluent Spanish speakers, we were culturing ourselves. On top of this, I was raised speaking Hebrew, and my abilities to translanguage between Hebrew, English, and Spanish were perceived as so cool and special. My Hebrew actually helped me pick up on parts of Spanish easier than my monolingual English-speaking peers, thanks to the many phonetic and grammatical similarities between the two languages. This was a great illustration for me of two different models of bilingual education, those being transitional and prestigious. The Spanish speakers in ESL classes were being taught subtractively to phase out their Spanish, or at least not develop it academically, being pushed to use English as their dominant mode of conduct. Meanwhile, English speakers were being taught Spanish in an additive context, which was designed to broaden their knowledge, abilities, and cultural capital. Another difference was that the foreign language was essentially an elective for us, and only one year was needed to graduate. Meanwhile, ESL was mandatory for English learners unless they were able to get good enough to test out of the program and into mainstream classes, as they're called. Although those students who learned English have greater capabilities in both languages, they are seen as merely reaching the starting line. Meanwhile, the English speakers who learned a bit of Spanish are seen as worldly and intelligent, even though their abilities to use their Spanish in the real world are quite limited, and through lack of use, most of them will forget it all soon enough. Of course, none of the students are to blame for how they were taught, as these decisions come from the top down. From politicians to local officials to school administrators to teachers, the decisions on how to teach come from those in power and down through to well-meaning teachers who end up perpetuating systemic inequalities despite their best intentions. English learners are also often under pressure from their parents, many of whom don't speak English, to get good at the language so that they'll have more economic opportunities and get taken more seriously. Through talking to my friends with immigrant parents, as well as through class readings, I can really understand why immigrant parents would want their children to learn English and why they wouldn't emphasize the home language because they have been affected by so much racism and xenophobia and don't want their kids to go through the same. They want life to be easier for their children, which is completely understandable, if slightly misguided. It is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for individuals to overcome systems, so in the face of American cultural hegemony, I would not blame anyone for trying to ensure that their children avoid the harsh social repercussions that they themselves experienced. As Guadalupe Valdez writes, Individuals of goodwill are not aware that they have become instruments of dominant interests. They are seldom conscious of the fact that power is exercised both through coercion and through consent, and that in many cases, people consent to preserving the status quo and to maintaining existing power relationships simply by accepting established practices without question. Although teachers are just individuals, it does not mean that they are powerless. Many strategies can be used to promote multilingualism, such as the concept of linguistic prescriptivism versus descriptivism. Essentially, prescriptivists operate from the baseline that there is one correct way to speak a given language with any deviation perceived as aberrant, whereas descriptivists simply observe and analyze how people are using language and draw conclusions from those analyses. This framework can be useful in so many contexts, but here in the context of language, it can be useful in preventing an educator from judging their students poorly for their creative implementations of language. A great example is AAVE, or African American Vernacular English, which differs from standard American English in several ways, but still fits all the criteria for being legitimate language. A prescriptivist would likely punish AAVE speakers for making a mockery of English and try to correct them, but a descriptivist teacher would more open-mindedly do their best to understand and glean a meaning from this different way of speaking and see how the student's existing language skills could be brought into the academic context. This could lead to my next strategy, which is the proliferation of translanguaging, which I briefly mentioned earlier. Ophelia Garcia describes translanguaging as a practice of engaging in bilingual or multilingual discourse practices centered not on languages, as has often been the case, but on the practices of bilinguals that are readily observable. 
Here she complicates what we think of when we say bilingual or multilingual as not simply a person having fluency in two or more languages as distinct entities, but the ways in which people who speak more than one language mix and match bits and pieces of their languages as they see fit. This is something I've always done in casual settings, mixing Hebrew and English with my family, and throwing in little words and phrases from other languages with friends, such as Keora es, Skusi, and Gesundheit. Garcia argues that such naturally occurring language practices ought to be taught and encouraged in schools, especially in bilingual education. Besides being more accurate to how multilingual speakers use their languages, it also allows for students who are still learning a new language to make use of their existing skills in the languages they already know. This can mitigate circumstances like my classmates from the initial example experienced, in which their skills in Spanish were not only left unused, they were made to feel a sense of shame for even having those skills in the first place. If only their teachers had drawn from their fountains of linguistic knowledge and found ways to incorporate or simply just allow them in the classroom, things could have been so much better. Thank you very much. I've been Yali. I hope you have a great day. Bye.